are four parts to this test. One, two, three, and four. Part one, Malawi. You will hear a talk about the country Malawi. For questions one to ten, complete the sentences. Malawi is one of the smaller African nations. Squashed between Tanzania, Mozambique and Zambia, it has no access to the sea. It used to be known as Nyasaland, a name given to it by its colonial rulers late in the 19th century. It didn't become independent from Britain until the 1960s, when it took on its new name, Malawi. The country is dominated by a huge lake, Lake Malawi, the length of England. I travelled down it on a ship called Entendere, starting at Chilumba in the north. Ahead lay a journey through the heart of Africa which would take at least three days, and with the ship the only form of transport on the lake, it was no surprise that it was packed to the brim with all kinds of people and goods. We passed dozens of little fishing villages with thatched roofs and mud walls, and I didn't see any motorboats or cars. With most places not having harbours, the ship's lifeboats were the only way of getting ashore. Up in the north, there is no access to many of the villages by road, and the people rely entirely on the ship's twice-weekly visit for all their supplies. For people and mail, it's the only way to enter or leave the outside world. It's a lifeline, and its arrival is a big and joyful event. The vast majority of Malawians have a lifestyle much as they've had for hundreds of years, living in mud and thatched huts, eating what they grow or what they can fish. It's on the shores of the western side of the lake that the work is done, and the fish that keep them all alive are brought ashore by hand, just as they have been for centuries. There are no cars in the villages on the shores of the lake, no telephones, and no supply of electricity or running water. Malawi is one of the very few countries in the world without television, so live entertainment is the only form of entertainment, with music and instruments that are homemade. Life below the water of Lake Malawi is as colourful and varied as life above it. About 1,000 unique species have been discovered in the lake. Many came to light in the 1950s and are stored, still waiting to be logged and classified. After 300 miles on the most beautiful, unpolluted lake I'd ever seen, the ship reached its most southerly point, the port of Monkey Bay. Sadly, it was the end of my journey, but within a few hours, the Entendere had been refueled and restocked and was heading back up to the lakeside villages that rely so much upon her. That is the end of part one. Part 2. Animal Watch. You will hear the presenter of a program about animals giving details of a scheme. For questions 11 to 18, fill in the missing information. Our next item is for all those of you who are interested not just in seeing or learning about animals, but also in doing something to help them. I'm sure that many of you would have been to Finden Zoo and Hanthorn Animal Park, but you may not be aware of the wealth of activity that goes on behind the scenes in those places to do with helping rare and endangered species. Beyond both of those institutions, there are all sorts of projects going on which are helping to save animals in the wild. And you too can help. How? By joining Animal Watch, a new animal conservation membership scheme run jointly by the zoo and the animal park. It is already playing a major role in raising awareness of, and money for, important wildlife projects, which are undertaken every year. So by joining, you'll be lending a hand to help safeguard the future survival of some of the world's rarest animals. For example, because of illegal hunting, there are now fewer than 4,000 black rhinos in Africa, and in conjunction with the Kenya Wildlife Service, Animal Watch is developing a management plan for the future survival of rhinos in Kenya. And Animal Watch is also very involved in returning animals to the wild. With your help, and the help of other members, they'll be able to return many more to the wild in the future. So, what are the details on joining? Well, membership costs £10, and this fee will not only make a major contribution to animal conservation, but also entitle you to all of the following. A membership card giving you free entry to Finden Zoo and Hanthorn Animal Park for a full year, 
three editions of the magazine Explorer's News, and special discounts at the Findon Zoo and Hanthorn Animal Park shops. You can join by picking up an application form at either of the two institutions, or you can phone them and you'll be sent one. All you do then is simply fill it in and then return it, together with the membership fee. So why not join and help animals all over the world? OK, next we're going to find out just what happened when our reporter, Linda Flood, went to Scandinavia in search of the letter spot. That is the end of part two. Part three, children's book writers. You will hear a radio interview with a husband and wife who write books for children. For questions 19 to 25, indicate the most appropriate response, A, B, C or D. My guests today are Ben and Carol Morris, husband and wife authors of some of our most successful children's books. Ben, what's it like working at home together? Does it present difficulties and is there a temptation to waste time just chatting? No, it works very well. I think it's very important to be able to talk to somebody when you're doing a book. It's important to have somebody there so that you can say, what do you think of this idea? How do you think this drawing is going? And there's very little lost time because there are two of us. Is it that one of you does the drawings and one of you does the text? No, it's not quite as simple as that. We both draw and we both do the text. We do lots of rough drafts. Each drawing in a book can sometimes take up to five stages. You'll have your initial idea for your page, and you might have to research something, like in one book we did that's got lots of spacecraft and things, so that they're semi-realistic. So there's lots of drawing that goes into doing each book, and we both work on them. Each day, each day is very different. Um, Carol's actually been researching a book recently and producing the sketches for a book about cats. And um, because she's been involved with that, I've been able to finish off another book for the same publisher, which simply requires artwork. So that's how it is today. You come and see us maybe in a month's time, then perhaps we'll both be into the cat book and deciding which drawings, which jokes, which visual jokes can go in. Yes, you mentioned visual jokes there. In actual fact, that's quite interesting, because your books are very much part of an idea, perhaps you could almost call it a movement, that has taken books for the very young away from the idea of just simply a picture, one line of text, turn over the page, a picture, one line of text. Your books have moved right away from that, haven't they? Is that something you worked out, or that just happened? I think it's probably because, as a parent, when you start to read books to your children, and certainly some years ago, you'd be reading a book and uh, it would become tedious, there'd be very little in it to uh, keep your attention going, and often you'd be jumping pages, and the child would say, oh, you've missed that, go back. And you'd go back and you'd be reading this terrible, repetitive book. And we thought, if there could be books where you could build in another layer to it, so we did a series of books, and we had the story running, and then we had, we had cartoon characters at the bottom making fun of the whole thing, commenting on it. And that was almost for ourselves, to sort of keep our interest going, and that seems to be the thing that the parents feel. The parents realize that these two little characters are sending the whole thing up, and that it's not getting too serious. Do you think that books can be toys? Fun. I think that's our overriding drive with the books, to make them fun for children. We don't want them to open a book and get frightened by all the print. We want the children to work their way through each page, find bits and pieces, go back in the book, find a little rhyme or something that they missed, so that they're constantly amused and they don't actually realize that they're reading. I think it's about books becoming games. If you can make a book fun, it's to do with the whole concept of a book, isn't it? You can say book to some children and it puts them off immediately. But if you say it's a toy rather than a book, it's almost as if books have the wrong name. And if a child enjoys playing with a book, the book becomes a game and that makes reading fun. Well, your books are very inventive and very funny. Um, can you keep the jokes coming? Are they ever going to run out? I hope not. I'm sure we have lots more ideas in us yet. Ben and Carol Morris, thanks very much. Next week, Jane Smith joins me to look at new fiction for older children. That is the end of part three. Part four, recent purchases. 
you will hear extracts of five different people talking about things they have recently bought. Task 1. Letters A to H list different items. As you listen, put them in the order in which you hear them being talked about by completing the boxes numbered 26 to 30 with the appropriate letter. Task 2. Letters A to H list the different opinions expressed by the people speaking in the five extracts. As you listen, put them in the order in which you hear them by completing the boxes numbered 31 to 35 with the appropriate letter. Yes, well, they came round and delivered it last week. They had awful trouble getting it through the door and up the stairs, and they fitted it in in no time at all. It wasn't all that difficult to work out how to use it. There's a manual that explains all the switches and dials and buttons. It costs quite a bit, but then it isn't just your average model, and I'm certainly not expecting to have to replace it for ages. I mean, it's on a long guarantee, and it's not the sort of thing you get all that often, is it? It's so handy having it, None of that endless scrubbing anymore. I just can't imagine how I ever managed without it. Anyway, I'll have to go. Sheets are probably done by now and I'll have to hang them out. I had a bit of trouble with the reception when I first got it. The sound was rather muffled and sometimes there was like a shadow on the screen. But I've had them round to look at it and apparently it was something to do with the tuning and they sorted that out. I chose the make mostly because of the design. I mean, some of them can be really ugly and take up far too much space, don't you think? I guess it's a question of taste, but I like the shape of it, and it fits in well with everything else. Of course, since I've bought it, I've seen it advertised much cheaper somewhere else, but that always happens, doesn't it? It might not be the prettiest thing in the world, but it does the job okay, and that's all I really care about. The last one I had was really old, and it wasn't picking things up very well, so I thought it was about time I splashed out on a new one. It's got this special attachment for getting dust and bits out of difficult places, which the other one didn't have. And it's got a very long lead, so you don't have to keep taking it out and plugging it in again. The only trouble is, it makes the most dreadful racket. I mean, when you've got it switched on, you can hardly hear yourself think. Well, you know, everyone says how useful they are, so I thought I'd better get one. But to be honest, I still can't see how it makes anything better for me. I thought I'd never be able to sort out how it works. These complicated modern things aren't my strong point, you know, but that hasn't been the case. No, it's just that it can do all these things I don't need. I mean, apart from anything else, my finances are hardly that complex and I have no particular desire to work out what they're going to be for years to come. Mind you, one thing's for sure. Now I've bought it, I'm going to be broke for ages. I wish I hadn't bothered. I thought I'd worked everything out just right when I ordered it, but when it arrived, I realised that it didn't quite fit where I was going to put it. So I've just had to put it where there's enough room for it, which is by no means satisfactory. Apart from that, though, there's nothing wrong with it. You can defrost things in it. I couldn't do that with the last one. There's plenty of space in it, and it's easy to clean. It takes a bit longer than the last one to heat up when you switch it on, but I've got used to that, and everything I've done in it so far has come out just right. You set the timer, and when it makes a sort of beep noise, you know that whatever you've got in there is ready. That is the end of part four.